The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Truth and Fiction Relating to My Life by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe Translated by John Oxenford Section 22 Seventh Book, Part 1 about the condition of German literature of those times so much has been written, and so exhaustively, that everyone who takes any interest in it can be completely informed. In regard to it critics agree now pretty well, and what at present I intend to say piecemeal and disconnectedly concerning it, relates not so much to the way in which it was constituted in itself, as to its relation to me. I will therefore first speak of those things by which the public is particularly excited, of those two hereditary foes of all comfortable life, and of all cheerful, self-sufficient, living poetry. I mean satire and criticism. In quiet times everyone wants to live after his own fashion. The citizen will carry on his trade or his business, and enjoy the fruits of it afterwards. Thus will the author, too, willingly compose something, publish his labours, and, since he thinks he has done something good and useful, hope for praise, if not reward. In this tranquillity the citizen is disturbed by the satirist, the author by the critic, and peaceful society is thus put into a disagreeable agitation. The literary epoch in which I was born was developed out of the preceding one by opposition. Germany, so long inundated by foreigners, interpenetrated by other nations, directed to foreign languages in learned and diplomatic transactions, could not possibly cultivate her own. Together with so many new ideas, innumerable foreign words were obtruded necessarily and unnecessarily upon her, and, even for objects already known, people were induced to make use of foreign expressions and turns of speech. The German, having run wild for nearly two hundred years in an unhappy, tumultuary state, went to school with the French to learn manners, and with the Romans in order to express his thoughts with propriety. But this was to be done in the mother tongue, when the literal application of those idioms and their half germanization made both the social and business style ridiculous besides this they adopted without moderation the similes of the southern languages and employed them most extravagantly in the same way they transferred the stately deportment of the prince-like citizens of rome to the learned german small-town officers and were at home nowhere least of all with themselves but as in this epoch works of genius had already appeared the German sense of freedom and joy also began to stir itself. This, accompanied by a genuine earnestness, insisted that men should write purely and naturally, without the intermixture of foreign words, and as common intelligible sense dictated. By these praiseworthy endeavours, however, the doors and gates were thrown open to an extended national insipidity, nay, the dyke was dug through by which the great deluge was shortly to rush in. Meanwhile a stiff pedantry long stood its ground in all the four faculties, until at last, much later, it fled for refuge from one of them to another. Men of parts, children of nature looking freely about them, had therefore two objects on which they could exercise themselves, against which they could labour, and, as the matter was of no great importance, give a vent to their petulance. These were, a language disfigured by foreign words, forms, and turns of speech on the one hand, and the worthlessness of such writings as had been careful to keep themselves free from those faults on the other. Though it occurred to nobody that, while they were battling against one evil, the other was called on for assistance. Lisko, a daring young man, first ventured to attack by name a shallow, silly writer, whose awkward demeanour soon gave him an opportunity to proceed still more severely. He then went farther, and constantly aimed his scorn at particular persons and objects, whom he despised and sought to render despicable, nay, even persecuted them with passionate hatred. But his career was short, for he soon died and was gradually forgotten as a restless, irregular youth. The talent and character shown in what he did, although he had accomplished little, may have seemed valuable to his countrymen, for the Germans have always shown a peculiar pious kindliness to talents of good promise, when prematurely cut off. Suffice it to say that Lisko was very soon praised and recommended to us as an excellent satirist, who could have attained a rank even above the universally beloved Rabener. Here indeed we saw ourselves no better off than before, for we could discover nothing in his writings except that he had found the silly silly, which seemed to us quite a matter of course. 
Rabana, well-educated, grown up under good scholastic instruction, of a cheerful and by no means passionate or malicious disposition, took up general satire. His censure of the so-called vices and follies springs from the clear views of a quiet common sense, and from a fixed moral conception of what the world ought to be. His denunciation of faults and failings is harmless and cheerful, and, in order to excuse even the slight boldness of his writings, it is supposed that the improving of fools by ridicule is no fruitless undertaking. Rabiner's personal character will not easily appear again. As an able, punctual man of business, he does his duty, and thus gains the good opinion of his fellow townsmen and the confidence of his superiors, along with which he gives himself up to the enjoyment of a pleasant contempt for all that immediately surrounds him, pedantic literati, vain youngsters, every sort of narrowness and conceit, he banters rather than satirizes, and even his banter expresses no contempt. Just in the same way does he jest about his own condition, his misfortune, his life, and his death. There is little of the aesthetic in the manner in which this writer treats his subjects. In external forms he is indeed varied enough, but throughout he makes too much use of direct irony, namely in praising the blameworthy and blaming the praiseworthy, whereas this figure of speech should be used but extremely seldom. For, in the long run, it becomes annoying to clear-sighted men, perplexes the weak, while indeed it pleases the great middle class who, without any special expense of mind, can fancy themselves more knowing than others. But whatever he brings before us, and however he does it, alike bears witness to his rectitude, cheerfulness, and equanimity, so that we always feel prepossessed in his favour. The unbounded applause of his own times was a consequence of such moral excellencies. That people looked for originals to his general descriptions and found them was natural. That individuals complained of him followed from the above. His lengthy apologies that his satire is not personal proved the spite it provoked. Some of his letters crown him at once as a man and an author. The confidential epistle in which he describes the siege of Dresden and how he loses his house, his effects, his writings and his wigs without having his equanimity in the least shaken or his cheerfulness clouded, is highly valuable. Although his contemporaries and fellow citizens could not forgive him his happy turn of mind. The letter where he speaks of the decay of his strength and of his approaching death is in the highest degree worthy of respect, and Rabiner deserves to be honoured as a saint by all cheerful, intelligent men who cheerfully resign themselves to earthly events. I tear myself away from him reluctantly, yet I would make this remark. His satire refers throughout to the middle class. He lets us see here and there that he is also well acquainted with the higher ranks, but does not hold it advisable to come in contact with them. It may be said that he has had no successor, that no one has been found who could consider himself equal or even similar to him. Now for criticism, and first of all for the theoretic attempts. It is not going too far when we say that the ideal had, at that time, escaped out of the world into religion. It scarcely even made its appearance in moral philosophy. Of a highest principle of art no one had a notion. They put Gottsched's critical art of poetry into our hands. It was useful and instructive enough, for it gave us a historical information of all the kinds of poetry, as well as of rhythm and its different movements. The poetic genius was presupposed. But, besides that, the poet was to have acquirements and even learning. He should possess taste and everything else of that kind. They directed us at last to Horace's Art of Poetry. We gazed at single golden maxims of this invaluable work, but did not know in the least what to do with it as a whole, or how we should use it. The Swiss stepped forth as Gottsched's antagonists. They must take it into their heads to do something different, to accomplish something better. Accordingly, we heard that they were, in fact, superior. Breitinger's critical art of poetry was taken in hand. Here we reached a wider field, but, properly speaking, only a greater labyrinth, which was so much the more tiresome, as an able man, in whom we had confidence, was driving us about in it. Let a brief review justify these words. For poetry in itself they had been able to find no fundamental axiom. It was too spiritual and too volatile. Painting, an art which one could hold fast with one's eyes, and follow step by step with the external senses, seemed more favourable for such an end. The English and French had already theorised about plastic art, and, by a comparison drawn from this, it was thought that poetry might be grounded, 
the former presented images to the eye, the latter to the imagination. Poetical images, therefore, were the first thing which was taken into consideration. People began with comparisons, descriptions followed, and only that was expressed which had always been apparent to the external senses. Images, then. But where should these images be got except from nature? The painter professedly imitated nature. Why not the poet also? But nature, as she lies before us, cannot be imitated. She contains so much that is insignificant and worthless, that one must make a selection. But what determines the choice? One must select that which is important. But what is important? To answer this question the Swiss may have taken a long time to consider, for they came to a notion, which is indeed singular, but clever, and even comical, inasmuch as they say, the new is always the most important. And after they have considered this for a while, they discover that the marvellous is always newer than everything else. They had now pretty well collected their poetical requisitions, but they had still to consider that the marvellous might also be empty, and without relation to man. But this relation, demanded as necessary, must be a moral one, from which the improvement of mankind should manifestly follow, and thus a poem had reached its utmost aim when, with everything else accomplished, it was useful besides. They now wished to test the different kinds of poetry according to all these requisites. Those which imitated nature, besides being marvellous, and at the same time of a moral aim and use, were to rank as the first and highest. And, after much deliberation, this great preeminence was at last ascribed, with the highest degree of conviction, to Aesop's fables. Strange as such a deduction may now appear, it had the most decided influence on the best minds. That Gellert and subsequently Lichtfer devoted themselves to this department, that even Lessing attempted to labour in it, that so many others turned their talents towards it, speaks for the confidence which this species of poetry had gained. Theory and practice always act upon each other. One can see from their works what is the men's opinion, and from their opinions predict what they will do. Yet we must not dismiss our Swiss theory without doing it justice. Bodmer, with all the pains he took, remained theoretically and practically a child all his life. Reitinger was an able, learned, sagacious man, whom, when he looked rightly about him, the essentials of a poem did not all escape. Nay, it can be shown that he may have dimly felt the deficiencies of his system. Remarkable, for instance, is his query whether a certain descriptive poem by Koenig on the review camp of Augustus the Second is properly a poem, and the answer to it displays good sense but it may serve for his complete justification that he, starting from a false point, on a circle almost run out already, still struck upon the main principle, and at the end of his book finds himself compelled to recommend as additions, so to speak, the representation of manners, character, passions, in short, the whole inner man, to which, indeed, poetry preeminently belongs. It may well be imagined into what perplexity young minds felt themselves thrown by such dislocated maxims, half-understood laws and shivered-up dogmas. We adhere to examples, and there, too, were no better off. Foreigners, as well as the ancients, stood too far from us, and from the best native poets always peeped out a decided individuality to the good points of which we could not lay claim, and into the faults of which we could not but be afraid of falling. For him who felt anything productive in himself, it was a desperate condition. When one considers closely what was wanting in the German poetry, it was a material, and that, too, a national one. There was never a lack of talent. Here we make mention only of Gunther, who may be called a poet in the full sense of the word, a decided talent endowed with sensuousness, imagination, memory, the gifts of conception and representation, productive in the highest degree, ready at rhythm, ingenious, witty, and of varied information besides. He possessed, in short, all the requisites for creating, by means of poetry, a second life within life, even within common real life. We admire the great facility with which, in his occasional poems, he elevates all circumstances by the feelings, and embellishes them with suitable sentiments, images, and historical and fabulous traditions. Their roughness and wildness belong to his time, his mode of life, and especially to his character, or, if one would have it so, his want of fixed character. He did not know how to curb himself, and so his life, like his poetry, melted away from him. By his vacillating conduct, Gunther had trifled away the good fortune of being appointed at the court of Augustus the Second, 
where, in addition to every other species of ostentation, they were also looking about for a court poet who could give elevation and grace to their festivities and immortalize a transitory pomp. Von Koenig was more manly and more fortunate. He filled this post with dignity and applause. In all sovereign states, the material for poetry comes downwards from above, and the review camp at Mühlberg, das Lustlager bei Mühlberg, was perhaps the first worthy object, provincial if not national, which presented itself to a poet. Two kings saluting one another in the presence of a great host, their whole courts and military state around them, well-appointed troops, a mock fight, fetes of all kinds. This is business enough for the outward sense, and overflowing material for delineating and descriptive poetry. This subject had indeed the internal defect that it was only pomp and show from which no real action could result. None except the very first distinguished themselves, and even if they had done so, the poet could not render any one conspicuous lest he should offend the others. He had to consult the court and state calendar, and the delineation of the persons therefore went off pretty dryly. Nay, even his contemporaries very strongly reproached him with having described the horses better than the men. But should not this redound to his credit that he showed his art just where an object for it presented itself? The main difficulty, too, seems soon to have manifested itself to him, since the poem never advanced beyond the first canto. Amidst such studies and reflections, an unexpected event surprised me and frustrated my laudable design of becoming acquainted with our new literature from the beginning. My countryman, John George Schlosser, after spending his academical years with industry and exertion, had repaired to Frankfurt on the Main in the customary profession of an advocate. But his mind, aspiring and seeking after the universal, could not reconcile itself to the situation for many reasons. He accepted, without hesitation, an office as private secretary to the Duke Ludwig of Württemberg, who resided in Treptow, for the prince was named among those great men who, in a noble and independent manner, purposed to enlighten themselves, their families, and the world, and to unite for higher aims. It was this Prince Ludwig who, to ask advice about the education of his children, had written to Rousseau, whose well-known answer began with the suspicious-looking phrase, Si j'avais le malheur d'être né prince, not only in the affairs of the prince, but also in the education of his children, Schlosser was now willingly to assist in word and deed, if not to superintend them. This noble young man, who harboured the best intentions, and strove to attain a perfect purity of morals, would have easily kept men from him by a certain dry austerity, if his fine and rare literary cultivation, his knowledge of languages, and his facility at expressing himself by writing, both in verse and prose, had not attracted every one, and made living with him more agreeable. It had been announced to me that he would pass through Leipzig, and I expected him with longing. He came and put up at a little inn, or wine-house, that stood in the Brühl, and the host of which was named Schoenkopf. This man had a Frankfurt woman for his wife, and although he entertained few persons during the rest of the year, and could lodge no guests in his little house, yet at fair time he was visited by many Frankfurters, who used to eat, and, in case of need, even take quarters there also. Thither I hastened to find Schlosser, when he had sent to inform me of his arrival. I scarcely remembered having seen him before, and found a young, well-formed man with a round, compressed face, without the features losing their sharpness on that account. The form of his rounded forehead, between black eyebrows and locks, indicated earnestness, sternness, and perhaps obstinacy. He was, in a certain measure, the opposite of myself, and this very thing doubtless laid the foundation of our lasting friendship. I had the greatest respect for his talents, the more so as I very well saw that, in the certainty with which he acted and produced, he was completely my superior. The respect and the confidence which I showed him confirmed his affection, and increased the indulgence he was compelled to have for my lively, impetuous, and ever-excitable disposition in such contrast with his own. He studied the English writers diligently. Pope, if not his model, was his aim, and in opposition to that author's essay on man, he had written a poem in like form and measure, which was to give the Christian religion the triumph over the deism of the other work. From the great store of papers which he carried with him, he showed me poetical and prose compositions in all languages, which, as they challenged me to imitation, once more gave me infinite disquietude. 
yet I contrived to get over it immediately by activity. I wrote German, French, English, and Italian poems, addressed to him, the subject matter of which I took from our conversations, which were always important and instructive. Schlosser did not wish to leave Leipzig without having seen face to face the men who had a name. I willingly took him to those I knew. With those whom I had not yet visited, I, in this way, became honourably acquainted, since he was received with distinction as a well-informed man of education, of already established character, and well knew how to pay for the outlay of conversation. I cannot pass over our visit we paid to Gottsched, as it exemplifies the character and manners of that man. He lived very respectably in the first story of the Golden Bear, where the elder Breitkopf, on account of the great advantage which Gottsched's writings, translations, and other aids had brought to the trade, had promised him a lodging for life. We were announced. The servant led us into a large chamber, saying his master would come immediately. Now, whether we misunderstood a gesture which he made, I cannot say. It is enough we thought he directed us into an adjoining room. We entered to witness a singular scene, for, on the instant, Gottsched, that tall, broad, gigantic man, came in at the opposite door in a morning gown of green damask, lined with red taffeta, but his monstrous head was bald and uncovered. This, however, was to be immediately provided for. The servant rushed in at a side door, with a great full-bottomed wig in his hand, the curls came down to the elbows, and handed the head ornament to his master with gestures of terror. Gottsched, without manifesting the least vexation, raised the wig from the servant's arm with his left hand, and, while he very dexterously swung it up on his head, gave the poor fellow such a box on the ear with his right paw that the latter, as often happens in a comedy, went spinning out at the door. Whereupon the respectable old grandfather invited us quite gravely to be seated, and kept up a pretty long discourse with good grace. As long as Schlosser remained in Leipzig, I dined daily with him, and became acquainted with a very pleasant set of boarders. Some Livonians, and the son of Hermann, chief court preacher in Dresden, afterwards burgomaster in Leipzig, and their tutor, Hofrath Feil, author of The Count von P., a continuation of Gellert's Swedish Countess, Zacharia, a brother of the poet, and Krabel, editor of geographical and genealogical manuals. All these were polite, cheerful, and friendly men. Zacharia was a most quiet, file an elegant man who had something almost diplomatic about him, yet without affectation and with great good humour. Crable, a genuine Falstaff, tall, corpulent, fair, with prominent merry eyes, as bright as the sky, always happy and in good spirits. These persons all treated me in the most handsome manner, partly on Schloss's account, partly too on account of my own frank good humour and obliging disposition, and it needed no great persuasion to make me partake of their table in future. In fact, I remained with them after Schloss's departure, deserted Ludwig's table, and found myself so much the better off in this society, which was limited to a certain number, as I was very well pleased with the daughter of the family, a very neat, pretty girl, and had opportunities to exchange friendly glances with her, a comfort which I had neither sought nor found by accident since the mischance with Gretchen. I spent the dinner hours with my friends cheerfully and profitably. Crable, indeed, loved me, and continued to tease me and stimulate me in moderation. File, on the contrary, showed his earnest affection for me by trying to guide and settle my judgment upon many points. End of Book 7, Part 1 The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1, by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, Section 23. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1 by Johann von Goethe, Section 23. Seventh Book, Part 2. During this intercourse, I perceived through conversation, through examples, and through my own reflections that the first step in delivering ourselves from the wishy-washy, long-winded, empty epoch, could be taken only by definiteness, precision, and brevity. In the style which had hitherto prevailed, one could not distinguish the commonplace from what was better, since all were brought down to a level with each other. Authors had already tried to escape from this widespread disease with more or less 
success Haller and Ramler were inclined to compression by nature Lessing and Wieland were led to it by reflection the former became by degrees quite epigrammatical in his poems terse in minna laconic in emilia galotti it was not till afterwards that he returned to that serene naivete which becomes him so well in nathan Bilant, who had been occasionally prolix in agathon don silvio and the comic tales becomes condensed and precise to a wonderful degree as well as exceedingly graceful in musarion and idris Kropstock, in the first cantos of the messiah is not without diffuseness in his odes and other minor poems he appears compressed as also in his tragedies by his emulation of the ancients especially tacitus he sees himself constantly forced into narrower limits by which he at last becomes obscure and unpalatable gerstenberg a fine but eccentric talent also distinguishes himself his merit is appreciated but on the whole he gives little pleasure Glein, diffuse and easy by nature is scarcely once concise in his war songs ramla is properly more a critic than a poet he begins to collect what the germans have accomplished in lyric poetry he now finds that scarcely one poem fully satisfies him he must leave out arrange and alter that the things may have some shape or other by this means he makes himself almost as many enemies as there are poets and amateurs since every one properly speaking recognizes himself only in his defects and the public interests itself sooner for a faulty individuality than for that which is produced or amended according to a universal law of taste rhythm lay yet in the cradle and no one knew of a method to shorten its childhood poetical prose came into the ascendant gessner and klopstock excited many imitators others again still demanded an intelligible metre and translated this prose into rhythm but even these gave nobody satisfaction for they were obliged to omit and add and the prose original always passed for the better of the two but the more with all this conciseness is aimed at the more does a judgment become possible since that which is important being more closely compressed allows a certain comparison at last it happened also at the same time that many kinds of truly poetical forms arose for as they tried to represent only what was necessary in the objects they wished to imitate they were forced to do justice to every one of these and in this manner though no one did it consciously the modes of representation multiplied themselves among which indeed were some which were really caricatures while many an attempt proved unsuccessful without question wieland possessed the finest natural gifts of all he had early cultivated himself thoroughly in those ideal regions where youth so readily lingers but when by what is called experience by the events of the world and women these were rendered distasteful to him he threw himself on the side of the actual and pleased himself and others with the contest of the two worlds where in light skirmishing between jest and earnest his talent displayed itself most beautifully how many of his brilliant productions fall under the time of my academic years musarion had the most effect upon me and i can yet remember the place and the very spot where i got sight of the first proof-sheet which oza gave me
here it was that i believed i saw antiquity again living and fresh everything that is plastic in wieland's genius here showed itself in its highest perfection and when that phanius timon condemned to an unhappy insipidity finally reconciles himself to his mistress and to the world one can well with him live through the misanthropical epoch for the rest we readily conceded to these works a cheerful aversion from those exalted sentiments which by reason of their easy misapplication to life are often open to the suspicion of dreaminess we pardoned the author for prosecuting with ridicule what we held as true and reverend the more readily as he thereby gave us to understand that it caused him continual trouble how miserably criticism then received such labours may be seen from the first volumes of the universal german library of the comic tales there is honourable mention but there is no trace of any insight into the character of the kind of poetry the reviewer like every one at that time had formed his taste by examples he never takes it into consideration that in a judgment of such parodistical works one must first of all have before one's eyes the original noble beautiful object in order to see whether the parodist has really gotten from it a weak and comical side whether he has borrowed anything from it or under the appearance of such an imitation has perhaps given us an excellent invention of his own of all this there is not a notion but the poems are praised and blamed by passages the reviewer as he himself confesses has marked so much that pleased him that he cannot quote it all in print when they even meet the highly meritorious translation of shakespeare with the exclamation by rights a man like shakespeare should not have been translated at all it will be understood without further remark how infinitely the universal german library was behindhand in matters of taste and that young people animated by true feeling had to look about them for other guiding stars the material which in this manner more or less determined the form the germans sought everywhere they had handled few national subjects or none at all schlegel's hermann only showed the way the idyllic tendency extended itself without end the want of distinctive character with gessner with all his great gracefulness and childlike heartiness made every one think that he could do something of the same kind just in the same manner out of the more generally human some snatch those poems which should have portrayed a foreign nationality as for instance the jewish pastoral poems those on the patriarchs altogether and whatever else related to the old testament bodmer's noachheid was a perfect symbol of the watery deluge that swelled high around the german parnassus and which abated but slowly the leading strings of anacreon likewise allowed innumerable mediocre geniuses to reel about at large the precision of horace compelled the germans though but slowly to conform to him comic heroic poems mostly after the model of pope's rape of the lock did not serve to bring in a better time i must here mention a delusion which operated as seriously as it must be ridiculous when one examines it more closely the germans had now sufficient historical knowledge of all the kinds of poetry in which the different nations had distinguished themselves this pigeonhole work which properly speaking totally destroys the inner conception of poetry had been already pretty completely hammered together by gottsched in his critical art of poetry 
and it had been shown at the same time that german poets too had already known how to fill up all the rubrics with excellent works and thus it ever went on each year the collection was more considerable but every year one work pushed another out of the place in which it had hitherto shone we now possessed if not homer's yet virgil's and milton's if not a pindar yet a horace of theocrituses there was no lack and thus they weighed themselves by comparisons from without whilst the mass of poetical works always increased so that at last there could be a comparison from within now though matters of taste stood on a very uncertain footing there could be no dispute but that within the protestant part of germany and of switzerland what is generally called common sense began to stir briskly at that epoch the scholastic philosophy which always has the merit of propounding according to received axioms in a favourite order and under fixed rubrics everything about which man can at all inquire had by the frequent darkness and apparent uselessness of its subject matter by its unseasonable application of a method in itself respectable and by its too great extension over so many subjects made itself foreign to the mass unpalatable and at last superfluous many a one became convinced that nature had endowed him with as great a portion of good and straightforward sense as perchance he required to form such a clear notion of objects that he could manage them and turn them to his own profit and that of others without laboriously troubling himself about the most universal problems and inquiring how the most remote things which do not particularly affect us may hang together men made the trial opened their eyes looked straight before them observant industrious active and believed that when one judges and acts correctly in one's own circle one may well presume to speak of other things also which lie at a greater distance in accordance with such a notion every one was now entitled not only to philosophize but also by degrees to consider himself a philosopher philosophy therefore was more or less sound and practised common sense which ventured to enter upon the universal and to decide upon inner and outer experiences a clear-sighted acuteness and an especial moderation while the middle path and fairness to all opinions was held to be right procured respect and confidence for writings and oral statements of the sort and thus at last philosophers were found in all the faculties nay in all classes and trades in this way the theologians could not help inclining to what is called natural religion and when the discussion was how far the light of nature may suffice to advance us in the knowledge of god and the improving and ennobling of ourselves they commonly ventured to decide in its favour without much scruple according to the same principle of moderation they then granted equal rights to all the positive religions by which they all became alike indifferent and uncertain for the rest they let everything stand and since the bible is so full of matter that more than any other book it offers material for reflection and opportunity for meditation on human affairs it could still as before be always laid as the foundation of all sermons and other religious treatises but over this work as well as over the whole body of profane writers was impending a singular fate which in the lapse of time was not to be averted hitherto it had been received as a matter of implicit faith that this book of books was composed in one spirit that it was even inspired and as it were dictated by 
the divine spirit. Yet for a long time already the discrepancies of the different parts of it had been now cavilled at, now apologized for, by believers and unbelievers. English, French and Germans had attacked the Bible with more or less violence, acuteness, audacity and wantonness, and just as often had it been taken under the protection of earnest, sound-thinking men of each nation. As for myself, I loved and valued it, for almost to it alone did I owe my moral culture, and the events, the doctrines, the symbols, the similes, had all impressed themselves deeply upon me, and had influenced me in one way or another. These unjust, scoffing and perverting attacks, therefore, disgusted me. But people had already gone so far as very willingly to admit, partly as a main ground for the defence of many passages, that God had accommodated himself to the modes of thought and power of comprehension in men that even those moved by the spirit had not on that account been able to renounce their character their individuality and that amos a cowherd did not use the language of isaiah who was said to have been a prince out of such views and convictions especially with a constantly increasing knowledge of languages was very naturally developed that kind of study by which it was attempted to examine more accurately the oriental localities nationalities natural products and phenomena and in this manner to make present to oneself that ancient time michaelis employed the whole strength of his talents and his knowledge on this side descriptions of travels became a powerful help in explaining the holy scriptures and later travellers furnished with numerous questions were made by the answers to them to bear witness for the prophets and apostles but whilst they were on all sides busied to bring the holy scriptures to a natural intuition and to render peculiar modes of thought and representation in them more universally comprehensible that by this historico-critical aspect many an objection might be removed many offensive things effaced and many a shallow scoffing be made ineffective there appeared in some men just the opposite disposition since these chose the darkest most mysterious writings as the subject of their meditations and wished if not to elucidate them yet to confirm them through internal evidence by means of conjectures calculations and other ingenious and strange combinations and so far as they contained prophecies to prove them by the results and thus to justify a faith in what was next to be expected the venerable bengal had procured a decided reception for his labours on the revelation of st john from the fact that he was known as an intelligent upright god-fearing blameless man deep minds are compelled to live in the past as well as in the future the ordinary movements of the world can be of no importance to them if they do not in the course of ages up to the present revere prophecies which have been revealed and in the immediate as well as in the most remote futurity predictions still veiled hence arises a connection that is wanting in history which seems to give us only an accidental wavering backwards and forwards in a necessary limited circle dr crucius was one of those whom the prophetic part of scripture suited more than any other since it brings into action the two most opposite qualities of human nature the affections and the acuteness of the intellect many young men had devoted themselves to this doctrine and already formed a respectable body which attracted the more attention as ernesti with his friends threatened not to illuminate but completely to disperse the obscurity in which these delighted hence arose controversies hatred persecution 
and much that was unpleasant. I attached myself to the lucid party, and sought to appropriate to myself their principles and advantages, although I ventured to forebode that by this extremely praiseworthy intelligent method of interpretation the poetic contents of the writings must at last be lost, along with the prophetical. But those who devoted themselves to German literature and the belles lettres were more nearly concerned with the efforts of such men who, as Jerusalem, Solikaufer, and Spalding, tried by means of a good and pure style in their sermons and treatises to gain, even among persons of a certain degree of sense and taste, applause and attachment for religion and for the moral philosophy which is so closely related to it a pleasing manner of writing began to be necessary everywhere and since such a manner must above all be comprehensible so did writers arise on many sides who undertook to write about their studies and their professions clearly perspicuously and impressively and as well for the adepts as for the multitude after the example of Tiso, a foreigner, the physicians also now began to labour zealously for the general cultivation. Halla, Unza, Zimmermann had a very great influence, and whatever may be said against them in detail, especially the last, they produced a very great effect in their time. And mention should be made of this in history, but particularly in biography. For a man remains of consequence not so far as he leaves something behind him, but so far as he acts and enjoys, and rouses others to action and enjoyment. The jurists, accustomed from their youth upward to an abstruse style, which in all legal papers, from the petty court of the immediate night up to the imperial diet at Ratisbon, was still maintained in all its quaintness, could not easily elevate themselves to a certain freedom, the less so as the subjects of which they had to treat were most intimately connected with the external form, and consequently also with the style. But the younger von Moser had already shown himself an independent and original writer, and Putter, by the clearness of his delivery, had also brought clearness into his subject and the style in which he was to treat it. All that proceeded from his school was distinguished by this, and even the philosophers, in order to be popular, now found themselves compelled to write clearly and intelligibly. Mendelssohn and Garve appeared and excited universal interest and admiration. With the cultivation of the German language and style in every department, the capacity for forming a judgment also increased, and we admire the reviews then published of works upon religious and moral as well as medical subjects, while, on the contrary, we remark that the judgments of poems and of whatever else may relate to the ballette will be found, if not pitiful, at least very feeble. This holds good of the literary epistles, Literaturbriefen, and of the universal German library, as well as of the library of the Belles Lettres, notable instances of which could easily be produced. No matter in how motley a manner, all this might be confused still, for every one who contemplated producing anything from himself who would not merely take the words and phrases out of the mouths of his predecessors, there was nothing further left but early and late to look about him for some subject matter which he might determine to use. Here, too, we were much led astray. People were constantly repeating a saying of Kleist, which we had to hear often enough. He had sportively, ingeniously, and truly replied to those who took him to task on account of his frequent lonely walks, 
but he was not idle at such times he was going to the image hunt this simile was very suitable for a nobleman and soldier who by it placed himself in contrast with the men of his rank who did not neglect going out with their guns on their shoulders hare hunting and partridge shooting as often as an opportunity presented itself hence we find in kleist's poems many such individual images happily seized though not always happily elaborated which in a kindly manner remind us of nature but now they also recommended us quite seriously to go out on the image hunt which did not at last leave us wholly without fruit although apple's garden the kitchen gardens the rosenthal gollis Raschwitz, and konnewitz would be the oddest ground to beat up poetical game in and yet i was often induced by that motive to contrive that my walk should be solitary and because many objects neither beautiful nor sublime met the eye of the beholder and in the truly splendid rosenthal the gnats in the best season of the year allowed no tender thoughts to arise so did i by unwearied persevering endeavour become extremely attentive to the small life of nature i would use this word after the analogy of still life and since the pretty events which one perceives within this circle represent but little in themselves so i accustomed myself to see in them a significance which inclined now towards the symbolical now towards the allegorical side accordingly as intuition feeling or reflection had the preponderance i will relate one incident in place of many i was after the fashion of humanity in love with my name and as young uneducated people commonly do wrote it down everywhere once i had carved it very handsomely and accurately on the smooth bark of a linden tree of moderate age the following autumn when my affection for annette was in its fullest bloom i took the trouble to cut hers above it towards the end of the winter in the meantime like a capricious lover i had wantonly sought many opportunities to tease her and cause her vexation in the spring i chanced to visit the spot and the sap which was rising strongly in the trees had welled out through the incisions which formed her name and which were not yet crusted over and moistened with innocent vegetable tears the already hardened traces of my own thus to see her here weeping over me me who had so often called up her tears by my ill conduct filled me with confusion at the remembrance of my injustice and of her love even the tears came into my eyes i hastened to implore pardon of her doubly and trebly and i turned this incident into an idyll footnote die laune des verliebten translated as the lover's caprice see page two four one which i never could read to myself without affection or to others without emotion while i now like a shepherd on the pleisse was absorbed childishly enough in such tender subjects and always chose only such as i could easily recall into my bosom provision from a greater and more important side had long been made for german poets the first true and really vital material of the higher order came into german poetry through frederick the great and the deeds of the seven years war all national poetry must be shallow or become shallow which does not rest on that which is most universally human upon the events of nations and their shepherds when both stand for one man kings are to be represented in war and danger where by that merry means they appear as the first because they determine and share the fate of the very least 
and thus become much more interesting than the gods themselves who when they have once determined the fates withdraw from all participation in them in this view of the subject every nation if it will be worth anything at all must possess an epopy to which the precise form of the epic poem is not necessary the war songs started by Gleim, maintain so high a rank among german poems because they arose with and in the achievements which are their subject and because moreover their felicitous form just as if a fellow combatant had produced them in the loftiest moments makes us feel the most complete effectiveness ramla sings the deeds of his king in a different and most noble manner all his poems are full of matter and occupy us with great heart elevating objects and thus already maintain an indestructible value for the internal matter of the subject treated is the beginning and end of art it will not indeed be denied that genius that thoroughly cultivated artistical talent can make everything out of everything by its method of treatment and can subdue the most refractory material but when closely examined the result is rather a trick of art than a work of art which should rest upon a worthy object that the treatment of it by skill pains and industry may present to us the dignity of the subject matter only the more happily and splendidly the prussians and with them protestant germany acquired thus for their literature a treasure which the opposite party lacked and the want of which they have been able to supply by no subsequent endeavours upon the great idea which the prussian writers might well entertain of their king they first established themselves and the more zealously as he in whose name they did it all wished once for all to know nothing about them already before this through the french colony afterwards through the king's predilection for the literature of that nation and for their financial institutions had a mass of french civilization come into prussia which was highly advantageous to the germans since by it they were challenged to contradiction and resistance thus the very aversion of frederick from german was a fortunate thing for the formation of its literary character they did everything to attract the king's attention not indeed to be honoured but only noticed by him yet they did it in the german fashion from an internal conviction they did what they held to be right and desired and wished that the king should recognise and prize this german uprightness that did not and could not happen for how can it be required of a king who wishes to live and enjoy himself intellectually that he shall lose his years in order to see what he thinks barbarous developed and rendered palatable too late in matters of trade and manufacture he might indeed force upon himself but especially upon his people very moderate substitutes instead of excellent foreign wares but here everything comes to perfection more rapidly and it needs not a man's lifetime to bring such things to maturity but i must here first of all make honourable mention of one work the most genuine production of the seven years war and of perfect north german nationality it is the first theatrical production caught from the important events of life one of specific temporary value and one which therefore produced an incalculable effect minna von Bahnhelm. lessing who in opposition to klopstock and gleim was fond of casting off his personal dignity because he was confident that he could at any moment grasp and take it up again delighted in a dissipated life in taverns and the world as he always needed a strong counterpoise to his powerfully labouring interior and for this reason also he had joined the suite of 
General Tauentzin. One easily discovers how the above-mentioned peace was generated betwixt war and peace, hatred and affection. It was this production which happily opened the view into a higher, more significant world from the literary and citizen world in which poetic art had hitherto moved. The intense hatred in which the Prussians and Saxons stood towards each other during this war could not be removed by its termination. The Saxon now first felt with true bitterness the wounds which the upstart Prussian had inflicted upon him. Political peace could not immediately re-establish a peace between their dispositions. But this was to be brought about symbolically by the above-mentioned drama. The grace and amiability of the Saxon ladies conquer the worth, the dignity, the stubbornness of the Prussians and in the principal as well as in the subordinate characters a happy union of bizarre and contradictory elements is artistically represented if i have put my reader in some perplexity by these cursory and desultory remarks on german literature i have succeeded in giving them a conception of that chaotic condition in which my poor brain found itself when in the conflict of two epochs so important for the literary fatherland so much that was new crowded in upon me before i could come to terms with the old so much that was old yet made me feel its right over me when i believed i had already cause to venture on renouncing it altogether i will at present try to impart as well as possible the way i entered on to extricate myself from this difficulty if only step by step. The period of prolixity into which my use had fallen, I had laboured through with genuine industry, in company with so many worthy men. The numerous quarto volumes of manuscript which I left behind with my father might serve for sufficient witnesses of this, and what a mass of essays, rough drafts, and half-executed designs had more from despondency than conviction, gone up in smoke. Now, through conversation, through instruction in general, through so many conflicting opinions, but especially through my fellow boarder, Hofrat Pfeil, I learned to value more and more the importance of the subject matter and the conciseness of the treatment. Without, however, being able to make it clear to myself where the former was to be sought or how the latter was to be attained for what with the great narrowness of my situation what with the indifference of my companions the reserve of the professors the exclusiveness of the educated inhabitants and what with the perfect insignificance of the natural objects i was compelled to seek for everything within myself Whenever I desired a true basis in feeling or reflection for my poems, I was forced to grasp into my own bosom. Whenever I required for my poetic representation an immediate intuition of an object or an event, I could not step outside the circle which was fitted to teach me and inspire me with an interest. In this view I wrote at first certain little poems in the form of songs or in a freer measure they are founded on reflection treat of the past and for the most part take an epigrammatic turn and thus began that tendency from which i could not deviate my whole life through namely the tendency to turn into an image into a poem everything that delighted or troubled me or otherwise occupied me and to come to some certain understanding with myself upon it that i might both rectify my conceptions of external things and set my mind at rest about them the faculty of doing this was necessary to no one more than to me for my natural disposition whirled me constantly from one extreme to the other all therefore that has been confessed by me consists 
of fragments of a great confession and this little book is an attempt which i have ventured on to render it complete my early affection for gretchen i had now transferred to one annette ancien of whom i can say nothing more than that she was young handsome sprightly loving and so agreeable that she well deserved to be set up for a time in the shrine of the heart as a little saint that she might receive all that reverence which it often causes more pleasure to bestow than to receive i saw her daily without hindrance she helped to prepare the meals i enjoyed she brought in the evening at least the wine i drank and indeed our select club of noonday boarders was a warranty that the little house which was visited by few guests except during the fair well merited its good reputation opportunity and inclination were found for various kinds of amusement but as she neither could nor dared go much out of the house the pastime was somewhat limited we sang the songs of zachariah played the duke michael of kruger in which a knotted handkerchief had to take the place of the nightingale and so for a while it went on quite tolerably but since such connections the more innocent they are afford the less variety in the long run i was seized with that wicked distemper which seduces us to derive amusement from the torment of a beloved one and to domineer over a girl's devotedness with a wanton and tyrannical caprice my ill humour at the failure of my poetical attempts at the apparent impossibility of coming to a clear understanding about them and that everything else that might pinch me here and there i thought i might vent on her because she truly loved me with all her heart and did whatever she could to please me by unfounded and absurd fits of jealousy i destroyed our most delightful days both for myself and her she endured it for a time with incredible patience which i was cruel enough to try to the uttermost but to my shame and despair i was at last forced to remark that her heart was alienated from me and that i might now have good ground for the madness in which i had indulged without necessity and without cause there were also terrible scenes between us in which i gained nothing and i then first felt that i had truly loved her and could not bear to lose her my passion grew and assumed all the forms of which it is capable under such circumstances nay at last i even took up the role which the girl had hitherto played i sought everything possible in order to be agreeable to her even to procure her pleasure by means of others for i could not renounce the hope of winning her again but it was too late i had lost her really and the frenzy with which i revenged my fault upon myself by assaulting in various frantic ways my physical nature in order to inflict some hurt on my moral nature contributed very much to the bodily maladies under which i lost some of the best years of my life indeed i should perchance have been completely ruined by this loss had not my poetic talent here shown itself particularly helpful with its healing power already at many intervals before i had clearly enough perceived my ill conduct i really pitied the poor child when i saw her so thoroughly wounded by me without necessity i pictured to myself so often and so circumstantially her condition and my own and as a contrast the contented state of another couple in our company that at last i could not forbear treating this situation dramatically as a painful and instructive penance hence arose the oldest of my extant dramatic labours the little piece entitled die laune des verliebten the lover's caprice in the simple nature of which one may at the same time perceive the impetus of a boiling passion.
but before this a deep significant impulsive world had already interested me through my adventures with gretchen and its consequences i had early looked into the strange labyrinths by which civil society is undermined religion morals law rank connections custom all rule only the surface of city existence the streets bordered by splendid houses are kept neat and every one behaves himself there properly enough but indoors it often seems only so much the more disordered and a smooth exterior like a thin coat of mortar plasters over many a rotten wall that tumbles together overnight and produces an effect the more frightful as it comes into the midst of a condition of repose a great many families far and near i had seen already either overwhelmed in ruin or kept miserably hanging on the brink of it by means of bankruptcies divorces seduced daughters murders house robberies poisonings and young as i was i had often in such cases lent a hand for help and preservation for as my frankness awakened confidence as my secrecy was proved as my activity feared no sacrifice and loved best to exert itself in the most dangerous affairs i had often enough found opportunity to mediate to hush up to divert the lightning flash with every other assistance of the kind in the course of which as well in my own person as through others i could not fail to come to the knowledge of many afflicting and humiliating facts to relieve myself i designed several plays and wrote the arguments footnote, exposition in a dramatic sense properly means a statement of the events which take place before the action of the play commences translator of most of them but since the intrigues were always obliged to be painful and almost all these pieces threatened a tragical conclusion i let them drop one after another the mitschuldigen the accomplices is the only one that was finished the cheerful and burlesque tone of which upon the gloomy family ground appears as if accompanied by something causing anxiety so that on the whole it is painful in representation although it pleases in detached passages the illegal deeds harshly expressed wound the aesthetic and moral feeling and the piece could therefore find no favour on the german stage although the imitations of it which steered clear of those rocks were received with applause both the above-mentioned pieces were however written from a more elevated point of view without my having been aware of it they direct us to a considerate forbearance in casting moral imputations and in somewhat harsh and coarse touches sportively express that most christian maxim let him who is without sin among you cast the first stone through this earnestness which cast a gloom over my first pieces i committed the mistake of neglecting very favourable materials which lay quite decidedly in my natural disposition in the midst of these serious and for a young man fearful experiences was developed in me a reckless humour which feels itself superior to the moment and not only fears no danger but rather wantonly courts it the reason of this lay in the exuberance of spirits in which the vigorous time of life so much delights and which if it manifests itself in a frolicsome way causes much pleasure both at the moment and in remembrance these things are so usual that in the vocabulary of our young university friends they are called sweets and on account of the close similarity of signification to play sweets means just the same as to play pranks Footnote. the real meaning of the passage is that the idiom possenreisen is used also with the university word sweet so that one can say sweetenreisen translator 
such humorous acts of daring brought on the theatre with wit and sense are of the greatest effect they are distinguished from intrigue inasmuch as they are momentary and that their aim whenever they are to have one must not be remote beaumarchais has seized their full value and the effects of his figaro spring pre-eminently from this whereas such good-humoured roguish and half knavish pranks are practised with personal risk for noble ends the situations which arise from them are aesthetically and morally considered of the greatest value for the theatre as for instance the opera of the water carrier treats perhaps the happiest subject which we have ever yet seen upon the stage to enliven the extreme tedium of daily life i played off numberless tricks of the sort partly without any aim at all partly in the service of my friends whom i liked to please for myself i could not say that i had once acted in this designedly nor did i ever happen to consider a feat of the kind as a subject for art had i however seized upon and elaborated such materials which were so close at hand my earliest labours would have been more cheerful and available some incidents of this kind occur indeed later but isolated and without design for since the heart always lies nearer to us than the head and gives us trouble whereas the latter knows how to set matters to rights the affairs of the heart had always appeared to me as the most important i was never weary of reflecting upon the transient nature of attachments the mutability of human character moral sensuality and all the heights and depths the combination of which in our nature may be considered as the riddle of human life here too i sought to get rid of that which troubled me in a song an epigram in some kind of rhyme which since they referred to the most private feelings and the most peculiar circumstances could scarcely interest any one but myself in the meantime my external position had very much changed after the lapse of a short time madame Burma, after a long and melancholy illness had at last died she had latterly ceased to admit me to her presence her husband could not be very much satisfied with me i seemed to him not sufficiently industrious and too frivolous he especially took it very ill of me when it was told him that at the lectures on german public law instead of taking proper notes i had been drawing on the margin of my notebook the personages presented to our notice in them such as the president of the chamber the moderators and assessors in strange wigs and by this drollery had disturbed my attentive neighbours and set them laughing after the loss of his wife he lived still more retired than before and at last i shunned him in order to avoid his reproaches but it was peculiarly unfortunate that gellert would not use the power which he might have exercised over us indeed he had not time to play the father confessor and to inquire after the character and faults of everybody he therefore took the matter very much in the lump and thought to curb us by means of the church forms for this reason he commonly when he admitted us to his presence used to lower his little head and in his weeping winning voice to ask us whether we went regularly to church who was our confessor and whether we took the holy communion if we came off badly at this examination we were dismissed with lamentations we were more vexed than edified it could not help loving the man heartily end of section twenty three the autobiography of goethe volume one by johann von goethe translated by john oxenford section twenty four this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1, by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford. Section 24 On this occasion I cannot forbear recalling somewhat of my earlier youth, in order to make it obvious that the great affairs of the ecclesiastical religion must be carried on with order and coherence if they are to prove as fruitful as is expected the protestant service has too little fullness and consistency to be able to hold the congregation together hence it easily happens that members secede from it and either form little congregations of their own or without ecclesiastical connection quietly carry on their citizen life side by side thus for a considerable time complaints were made that church-goers were diminishing from year to year and just in the same ratio the persons who partook of the lord's supper with respect to both but especially the latter the cause lies close at hand but who dares to speak it out we will make the attempt in moral and religious as well as in physical and civil matters man does not like to do anything on the spur of the moment he needs a sequence from which results habit but he is to love and to perform what he is to love and to perform he cannot represent to himself as single or isolated and if he is to repeat anything willingly it must not have become strange to him if the protestant worship lacks fullness in general so let it be investigated in detail and it will be found that the protestant has too few sacraments nay indeed he has only one in which he is himself an actor the lord's supper for baptism he sees only when it is performed on others and is not greatly edified by it the sacraments are the higher part of religion the symbols to our senses of the extraordinary divine favor and grace in the lord's supper earthly lips are to receive a divine being embodied and partake of a heavenly under the form of an earthly nourishment this import is the same in all kinds of christian churches whether the sacrament is taken with more or less submission to the mystery with more or less accommodation as to that which is intelligible it always remains a great holy thing which in reality takes the place of the possible or the impossible the place of that which man can neither attain nor do without but such a sacrament should not stand alone no christian can partake of it with the true joy for which it is given if the symbolical or sacramental sense is not fostered within him he must be accustomed to regard the inner religion of the heart and that of the external churches as perfectly one as the great universal sacrament which again divides itself into so many others and communicates to these parts its holiness indestructibleness and eternity here a youthful pair join hands not for a passing salutation or for the dance the priest pronounces his blessing upon them and the bond is indissoluble it is not long before this wedding pair bring a likeness to the threshold of the altar it is purified with holy water and so incorporated into the church that it cannot forfeit this benefit but through the most monstrous apostasy the child in the course of life goes on progressing in earthly things of its own accord in heavenly things he must be instructed does it prove on examination that this has been fully done he is now received into the bosom of the church as an actual citizen as a true and voluntary professor not without outward tokens of the weightiness of his act now only he is decidedly a christian now for the first time he knows his advantages and also his duties but in the meantime a great deal that is strange has happened to him as a man through instruction and affliction he has come to know how critical appears the state of his inner self and there will constantly be a question of doctrines and of transgressions but punishment shall no longer take place for here in the infinite confusion in which he must entangle himself amid the conflict of natural and religious claims 
an admirable expedient is given him in confiding his deeds and misdeeds his infirmities and doubts to a worthy man appointed expressly for that purpose who knows how to calm to warn to strengthen him to chasten him likewise by symbolical punishments and at last by a complete washing away of his guilt to render him happy and to give him back pure and cleansed the tablet of his manhood thus prepared and purely set at rest by several sacramental acts which on closer examination branch forth again into minuter sacramental traits he kneels down to receive the host and that the mystery of this high act may be still enhanced he sees the chalice only in the distance it is no common eating and drinking that satisfies it is a heavenly feast which makes him thirst after heavenly drink let not the youth believe that this is all he has to do let not even the man believe it in earthly relations we are at last accustomed to depend on ourselves and even there knowledge understanding and character will not always suffice in heavenly things on the contrary we will never finish learning the higher feeling within us which often finds itself not even truly at home is besides oppressed by so much from without that our own power hardly administers all that is necessary for counsel consolation and help but to this end that remedy is instituted for our whole life and an intelligent pious man is continually waiting to show the right way to the wanderers and to relieve the distressed and what has been so well tried through the whole life is now to show forth all its healing power with tenfold activity at the gate of death with a capital d according to a trustful custom inculcated from youth upwards the dying man receives with fervor those symbolical significant assurances and there where every earthly warranty fails he is assured by a heavenly one of a blessed existence for all eternity he feels perfectly convinced that neither a hostile element nor a malignant spirit can hinder him from clothing himself with a glorified body so that in immediate relations with the godhead with a capital g he may partake of the boundless happiness which flows forth from him then in conclusion that the whole may be made holy the feet also are anointed and blessed they are to feel even in the event of possible recovery a repugnance to touching this earthly hard impenetrable soil a wonderful elasticity is to be imparted to them by which they spurn from under them the clod of earth which hitherto attracted them and so through a brilliant cycle of equally holy acts the beauty of which we have only briefly hinted at the cradle and the grave however far asunder they may chance to be are joined in one continuous circle but all these spiritual wonders spring not like other fruits from the natural soil where they can neither be sown nor planted nor cherished we must supplicate for them from another region a thing which cannot be done by all persons nor at all times here we meet the highest of these symbols derived from pious tradition we are told that one man may be more favored blessed and sanctified from above than another but that this may not appear as a natural gift this great boon bounded up with a heavy duty must be communicated to others by one authorized person to another and the greatest good that a man can attain without his having to obtain it by his own wrestling or grasping must be preserved and perpetuated on earth by spiritual inheritance in the very ordination of the priest is comprehended all that is necessary for the effectual solemnizing of those holy acts by which the multitude receive grace without any other activity being needful on their part than that of faith and implicit confidence and thus the priest joins the line of his predecessors and successors in the circle of those anointed with him representing the highest source of blessings so much the more gloriously as it is not he the priest whom we reverence but his office it is not his nod to which we bow the knee but the blessing which he imparts 
and which seems the more holy and to come the more immediately from heaven because earthly instrument cannot at all weaken or invalidate it by its own sinful nay wicked nature how is this truly spiritual connection shattered to pieces in protestantism by part of the above-mentioned symbols being declared apophrical and only a few canonical and how by their indifference to one of these will they prepare us for the high dignity of the others in my time i had been confided to the religious instruction of a good old infirm clergyman who had been confessor of the family for many years the catechism a paraphrase of it and the scheme of salvation i had at my fingers ends i lacked not one of the strongly proving biblical texts but from all this i reaped no fruit for as they assured me that the honest old man arranged his chief examination according to an old set form i lost all pleasure and inclination for the business spent the last week in all sorts of diversions laid in my hat the loose leaves borrowed from an older friend who had gotten them from the clergyman and unfeelingly and senselessly read aloud all that i should have known how to utter with feeling and conviction but i found my good intention and my aspirations in this important matter still more paralyzed by a dry spiritless routine when i was now to approach the confessional i was indeed conscious of having many failings but no great faults and that very consciousness diminished them since it directed me to the moral strength which lay within me and which with resolution and perseverance was at last to become master over the old adam we were taught that we were much better than the catholics for the very reason that we were not obliged to confess anything in particular in the confessional nay that this would not be at all proper even if we wished to do it i did not like this at all for i had the strangest religious doubts which i would readily have had cleared up on such an occasion now as this was not to be done i composed a confession for myself which while it well expressed my state of mind was to confess to an intelligent man in general terms that which i was forbidden to tell him in detail but when i entered the old choir of the barefoot friars when i approached the strange latticed closets in which the revered gentlemen used to be found for that purpose when the sexton opened the door for me when i now saw myself shut up in the narrow place face to face with my spiritual grandsire and he bade me welcome with his weak nasal voice all the light of my mind and heart was extinguished at once the well-conned confessional speech would not cross my lips in my embarrassment i opened the book i had in my hand and read from it the first short form i saw which was so general that anybody might have spoken it with quite a safe conscience i received absolution and withdrew neither warm nor cold went the next day with my parents to the table of the lord and for a few days behaved myself as was becoming after so holy an act in the sequel however there came over me that evil which from the fact of our religion being complicated by various dogmas and founded on texts of scripture which admit of several interpretations attacks scrupulous men in such a manner that it brings on a hypochondriacal condition and raises this to its highest point to fixed ideas i have known several men who though their manner of thinking and living was perfectly rational could not free themselves from thinking about the sin against the holy spirit and from the fear that they had committed it a similar trouble threatened me on the subject of the communion for the text that one who unworthily partakes of the sacrament eateth and drinketh damnation to himself had very early already made a monstrous impression upon me every fearful thing that i had read in the histories of the middle ages of the judgments of god of those most strange ordeals by red-hot iron flaming fire swelling water and even what the bible tells us of the drought which agrees well with the innocent but puffs up and bursts the guilty all this pictured itself to my imagination and formed itself into the most frightful combinations 
since false vows hypocrisy perjury blasphemy all seemed to weigh down the unworthy person at this most holy act which was so much the more horrible as no one could dare to pronounce himself worthy and the forgiveness of sins by which everything was to be at last done away was found limited by so many conditions that one could not with certainty dare appropriate it to one's self this gloomy scruple troubled me to such a degree and the expedient which they would represent to me as sufficient seemed so bald and feeble that it gave the bugbear only a more fearful aspect and as soon as i had reached leipzig i tried to free myself altogether from my connection with the church how oppressive then must have been to me the exhortations of Galen, whom considering the generally laconic style with which he was obliged to repel our obtrusiveness i was unwilling to trouble with such singular questions and the less so as in my more cheerful hours i weigh myself ashamed of them and at last left completely behind me the strange anguish of conscience together with church and altar Galert, in accordance with his pious feelings had composed for himself a course of ethics which from time to time he publicly read and thus in an honourable manner acquitted himself of his duty to the public Galer's writings had already for a long time been the foundation of german moral culture and every one anxiously wished to see that work printed but as this was not to be done until after the good man's death people thought themselves very fortunate to hear him deliver it himself in his lifetime the philosophical auditorium footnote the lecture room the word is also used in university language to denote a professor's audience and footnote was at such times crowded and the beautiful soul the pure will in the interest of the noble man in our welfare his exhortations warnings and entreaties uttered in a somewhat hollow and sorrowful tone made indeed an impression for the moment but this did not last long the less so as there were many scoffers who contrived to make us suspicious of his tender and as they thought enervating manner i remember a frenchman travelling through the town who asked what were the maxims and opinions of the man who attracted such an immense concourse when we had given him the necessary information he shook his head and said smiling laissez le faire il nous forme des dupes and thus also did good society which cannot easily endure anything worthy near it know how to spoil on occasion the moral influence which Galert might have had upon us now it was taken ill of him that he instructed the deans of distinction and wealth who were particularly recommended to him better than the other students and had a marked solicitude for them now he was charged with selfishness and nepotism for causing a table de hote to be established for these young men at his brother's house his brother a tall good-looking blunt unceremonious and somewhat coarse man had it was said been a fencing master and notwithstanding the too great lenity of his brother the noble boarders were often treated harshly and roughly hence the people thought they must again take the part of these young folks and pulled about the good reputation of the excellent Galert to such a degree that in order not to be mistaken about him we became indifferent towards him and visited him no more yet we always saluted him in our best manner when he came riding along on his tame grey horse this horse the elector had sent him to oblige him to take an exercise so necessary for his health a distinction for which he was not easily to be forgiven and thus by degrees the epoch approached when all authority was to vanish from before me and i was to become suspicious nay to despair even of the greatest and best individuals whom i had known or imagined frederick the second still stood at the head of all the distinguished men of the century in my thoughts and it must therefore have appeared very surprising to me that i could praise him as little before the inhabitants of leipzig as formerly in my grandfather's house they had felt the hand of war heavily it is true and therefore they were not to blame for not thinking the best of him who had begun and continued it 
they therefore were willing to let him pass as a distinguished but by no means as a great man there was no art they said in performing something with great means and if one spares neither lands nor money nor blood one may well accomplish one's purpose at last frederick had shown himself great in none of his plans and in nothing that he had properly speaking undertaken so long as it depended on him he had only gone on making blunders and what was extraordinary in him had only come to light when he was compelled to make these blunders good again it was purely from this that he had obtained his great reputation since every man wishes for himself the same talent for making good in a clever way the blunders which he frequently commits if one goes through the seven years war step by step it will be found that the king quite uselessly sacrificed his fine army and that it was his own fault that this ruinous feud had been protracted to so great a length a truly great man in general would have got the better of his enemies much sooner that was the end of a quotation in support of these opinions they could cite infinite details which i did not know how to deny and i felt the unbounded reverence which i had devoted to this remarkable prince from my youth upwards gradually cooling away as the inhabitants of leipzig had now destroyed for me the pleasant feeling of revering a great man so did a new friend whom i gained at the time very much diminish the respect which i entertained for my present fellow-citizens this friend was one of the strangest fellows in the world he was named berich and was tutor to the young count lindenau even his exterior was singular enough lean and well-built far advanced in his thirties a very large nose and altogether marked features he wore from morning till night a scratch which might well have been called a peruke he dressed himself very neatly and never went out but with his sword by his side and his hat under his arm he was one of those men who have quite a peculiar gift of killing time or rather who know how to make something out of nothing in order to pass time away everything he did had to be done with slowness and with a certain deportment which might have been called affected if berich had not even by nature had something affected in his manner he resembled an old frenchman and also spoke and wrote french very well and easily his greatest delight was to busy himself seriously about drolleries and to follow up without end any silly notion thus he was constantly dressed in grey and as the different parts of his attire were of different material and also of different shades he could reflect for whole days as to how he could procure one grey more for his body and was happy when he had succeeded in this and could put to shame us who had doubted it or had pronounced it impossible he then gave us long severe lectures about our lack of inventive power and our want of faith in his talents for the rest he had studied well was particularly versed in the modern languages and their literature and wrote an excellent hand he was very well disposed towards me and i having been always accustomed and inclined to the society of older persons soon attached myself to him my intercourse served him too for a special amusement since he took pleasure in taming my restlessness and impatience with which on the other hand i gave him enough to do in the art of poetry he had what is called taste a certain general opinion about the good and the bad the mediocre and tolerable but his judgment was rather censorious and he destroyed even the little faith in contemporary writers which i cherished within me by unfeeling remarks which he knew how to advance with wit and humor about the writings and poems of this man and that he received my productions with indulgence and let me have my own way but only on the condition that i should have nothing printed he promised me on the other hand that he himself would copy those pieces which he thought good and would present me with them in a handsome volume 
this undertaking now afforded an opportunity for the greatest possible waste of time for before he could find the right paper before he could make up his mind as to the size before he had settled the breadth of the margin and the form of handwriting before the crow quills were provided and cut into pens and indian ink was rubbed whole weeks passed without the least bit having been done with just as much ado he always set about his writing and really by degrees put together a most charming manuscript the title of the poems was in german text the verses themselves in a perpendicular saxon hand and at the end of every poem was an analogous vignette which he had either selected somewhat or other or had invented himself and in which he contrived to imitate very neatly the hatching of the woodcuts and tailpieces which are used for such purposes to show me these things as he went on to celebrate beforehand in a comical pathetical manner my good fortune in seeing myself immortalized in such exquisite handwriting and that in a style which no printing press could attain gave another occasion for passing the most agreeable hours in the meantime his intercourse was always secretly instructive by reason of his liberal acquirements and as he knew how to subdue my restless impetuous disposition was also quite wholesome for me in a moral sense he had too quite a peculiar abhorrence of roughness and his jests were always quaint without ever falling into the coarse or the trivial he indulged himself in a distorted aversion from his countrymen and described with ludicrous touches even what they were able to undertake he was particularly inexhaustible in a comical representation of individual persons as he found something to find fault with in the exterior of every one thus when we lay together at the window he could occupy himself for hours criticizing the passers-by and when he had censured them long enough in showing exactly and circumstantially how they ought to have dressed themselves ought to have walked and ought to have behaved to look like ordinary people such attempts for the most part ended in something improper and absurd so that we might not so much laugh at how the man looked but at how perchance he might have looked had he been mad enough to caricature himself in all such matters Barish went quite unmercifully to work without being in the slightest degree malicious on the other hand we knew how to tease him on our side by assuring him that to judge from his exterior he must be taken if not for a french dancing master at least for the academical teacher of the language this reproval was usually the signal for dissertations an hour long in which he used to set forth the difference wide as the heavens which there was between him and an old frenchman at the same time he commonly imputed to us all sorts of awkward attempts that we might possibly have made for the alteration and modification of his wardrobe my poetical compositions which i only carried on the more zealously as the transcript went on becoming more beautiful and more careful now inclined altogether to the natural and the true and if the subjects could not always be important i nevertheless always endeavored to express them clearly and pointedly the more so as my friend often gave me to understand what a great thing it was to write down a verse on dutch paper with the crow quill in the indian ink what time talent and exertion it required which ought not to be squandered on anything empty and superfluous he would at the same time open a finished parcel and circumstantially to explain what ought not to stand in this or that place or congratulate us that it actually did not stand there he then spoke with great contempt of the art of printing mimicked the compositor ridiculed his gestures and his hurried picking out of letters here and there and derived from this manoeuvre all the calamities of literature on the other hand he extolled the grace and noble posture of a writer and immediately sat down himself to exhibit it to us while he rated us at the same time for not demeaning ourselves at the writing-table precisely after his example and motto 
he now reverted to the contrast with the compositor turned a begun letter upside down and showed how unseemly it would be to write anything from the bottom to the top or from the right to the left with other things of like kind with which whole volumes might have been filled with such harmless fooleries we squandered our precious time while it could have occurred to none of us that anything would chance to proceed out of our circle which would awaken a general sensation and bring us into not the best repute gellert may have taken little pleasure in his practicum and if perhaps he took pleasure in giving some directions as to prose and poetical style he did it most privately only to a few among whom we could not number ourselves professor clodius thought to fill the gap which thus arose in the public instruction he had gained some renown in literature criticism and poetry and as a young lively obliging man found many friends both in the university and in the city gellert himself referred us to the lectures now commenced by him and as far as the practical manner was concerned we remarked little difference he too only criticized details corrected likewise with red ink and one found oneself in company with mere blunders without a prospect as to where the right was to be sought i had brought to him some of my little labors which he did not treat harshly but just at this time they wrote to me from home that i must without fail furnish a poem for my uncle's wedding i felt far removed from that light and frivolous period in which a similar thing would have given me pleasure and since i could get nothing out of the actual circumstance itself i determined to trick out my work in the best manner with extraneous ornament i therefore convened all olympus to consult about the marriage of a frankfurt lawyer and seriously enough to be sure as well became the festival of such an honourable man venus and themis had quarrelled for his sake but a roguish prank which amor played the latter gained the suit for the former and the gods decided in favour of the marriage my work by no means displeased me i received from home a handsome letter in its praise took the trouble to have another fair copy and hoped to exhort some applause from my professor also but here i missed my aim he took the matter severely and as he did not notice the tone of parody which nevertheless lay in the notion he declared the great expenditure of divine means for such an insignificant human end in the highest degree reprehensible inveighed against the use and abuse of such mythological figures as a false habit originating in pedantic times found the expression now too high now too low and in diverse particulars had indeed not spared the red ink though he asserted that he had yet done too little such pieces were read aloud and criticized anonymously it is true but we used to watch each other and it remained no secret that this unfortunate assembly of the gods was my work yet since his critique when i took his point of view seemed to be perfectly just and those divinities more nearly inspected were in fact only hollow shadow forms i cursed all olympus flung the whole mythic pantheon away and from that time amor and luna have been the only divinities which at all appear in my little poems among the persons whom berish had chosen as the butt of his wit clodius stood just at the head nor was it hard to find a comical side in him being of small stature rather stout and thick-set he was violent in his motions somewhat impetuous in his utterances and restless in his demeanour in all this he differed from his fellow-citizens who nevertheless willingly put up with him on account of his good qualities and the fine promise which he gave he was usually commissioned with the poems which had become necessary on festive occasions in the so-called ode he followed the manner employed by ramler whom however it alone suited but clodius as an imitator had especially marked the foreign words by means of which the poems of ramler come forth with a majestic pomp which because it is conformable to the greatness of his subject and the rest of his poetic treatment 
produces a very good effect on the ear feelings and imagination in clodius on the contrary these expressions had a heterogeneous air since his poetry was in other respects not calculated to elevate the mind in any manner now we had often been obliged to see such poems printed and highly lauded in our presence and we found it highly offensive that he who had sequestered the heathen gods from us now wished to hammer together another ladder to parnassus out of greek and roman word rungs these oft-recurring expressions stamped themselves firmly on our memory and in a merry hour when we were eating some most excellent cakes in the kitchen gardens parenthesis kolgarten in parenthesis it all at once struck me to put together these words of might and power in a poem on the cake baker hendel no sooner thought than done and let it stand here too as it was written on the wall of the house with a lead pencil a uh, hendel dessen rum vom zut zum norden reich wirnim den pon der zu deinem ohren stadt du bakst was gorlin und britten im sieg suchen mit schopfischen genie originale kuchen das kaffees ocean der sieg vor der er gießt ist susef aus der saft der von heimitus fließt dein haus ein monument wie wir denn konsten lohnen umhängen mit trophen er saut den nationen auch ohne diedem fand händel hier sein glück und rapte dem hothurn gar manch acht groschen stück glinst deine urn der einst in majestätischen pampe dann weint der Patriot an deinem Katakombe. Doch leb, dein Torus se von Idler brut ein Nest. Steh hoch wie der Olymp, wie der Parnassus fest. Kein Phalanx, Griechenland mit römischen Ballisten, Vermug Germanien und Händel zu verwusten. Dein Wohl ist unser Stolz, dein Leiden unser Schmerz, und Handels Tempel ist der Musensohin Herz. Footnote. The humor of the above consists not in the thoughts, but in the particular words employed. These have no remarkable effect in English, as to us the words of Latin origin are often as familiar as those which have Teutonic roots and these form the chief peculiarity of the style we have therefore given the poem in the original language with the peculiar words as indicated by goethe in italics and subjoin a literal translation it will be observed that we have said that the peculiarity consists chiefly not solely in the use of the foreign words for there are two or three instances of unquestionably German words which are italicized on account of their high-sounding pomp. Quote, o Handel, whose fame extends from south to north, hear the pan which ascends to thine ears. Thou bakest that which Gauls and Britons industriously seek, thou bakest with creative genius original cakes the ocean of coffee which pours itself out before thee is sweeter than the juice which flows from hymetus thy house a monument how we reward the arts hung around with trophies tells the nations even without a diadem handel formed his fortune here and robbed the Quarthurnus of many an eight groschen piece. When thy urn shines hereafter in majestic pomp, then will the patriot weep at thy catacomb. But live, let thy bed, parenthesis, Taurus, end parenthesis, be the nest of a noble brood 
stand high as olympus and firm as parnassus may no phalanx of greek with roman balisto be able to destroy germania and handel thy wheel is our pride thy woe our pain and handel's temple is the heart of the sons of the muses End of translation. this poem had its place for a long time among many others which disfigured the walls of that room without being noticed and we who had sufficiently amused ourselves with it forgot it altogether amongst other things a long time afterwards clodius came out with his maiden whose wisdom magnanimity and virtue we found infinitely ridiculous much as his first representation of the piece was applauded that evening when we met together in the wine-house i made a prologue in doggerel verse in which harlequin steps out with two great sacks places them on each side of the proscenium and after various preliminary jokes tells the spectators in confidence that in the two sacks moral ascetic dust is to be found which the actors will very frequently throw into their eyes one to wit was filled with good deeds that cost nothing and the other with splendidly expressed opinions that had no meaning behind them he reluctantly withdrew and sometimes came back earnestly exhorted the spectators to attend to his warning and shut their eyes reminded them that he had always been their friend and meant well with them with many more things of the kind this prologue was acted in the room on the spot by friend horn but the jest remained quite among ourselves not even a copy had been taken and the paper was soon lost however horn who had performed the harlequin very prettily took it into his head to enlarge my poem to handel by several verses and then to make it refer to medan he read it to us but we could not take any pleasure in it for we did not find the additions even ingenious while the first poem being written for quite a different purpose seemed to us disfigured our friend displeased with our indifference or rather censure may have shown it to others who found it new and amusing copies were now made of it to which the reputation of clodius's medan gave at once a rapid publicity universal disapproval was the consequence and the originators parenthesis, it was soon found out that the poem had proceeded from our clique in parenthesis, were severely censured for nothing of the sort had been seen since chronics and Ross attacks upon gutshed we had besides already secluded ourselves and now found ourselves quite in the case of the owl with respect to the other birds in dresden too they did not like the affair and it had for us serious if not unpleasant consequences for some time already count lindenau had not been quite satisfied with his son's tutor for although the young man was by no means neglected and Barish kept himself either in the chamber of the young court or at least close to it when the instructors gave their daily lessons regularly frequented the lectures with him never went out in the daytime without him and accompanied him in all his walks yet the rest of us were always to be found in apple's house and joined them whenever they went on a pleasure ramble this already excited some attention Barish, too, accustomed himself to our society, and at last, towards nine o'clock in the evenings, generally transferred his pupil into the hands of the valet de chambre, and went in quest of us to the wine-house, whither, however, he never used to come but in shoes and stockings, with his sword by his side, and commonly his hat under his arm the jokes and fooleries which he generally started went on ad infinitum thus for instance one of our friends had a habit of going away precisely at ten because he had a connection with a pretty girl with whom he could converse only at that hour we did not like to lose him and one evening when we sat very happily together very secretly determined that he would not let him off this time at the stroke of ten the other arose and took leave Barish called after him and begged him to wait a moment as he was just going with him 
he now began in the most amusing manner first to look after his sword which stood just before his eyes and in buckling it on behaved awkwardly so that he could never accomplish it he did this too so naturally that no one took offence at it but when to vary the theme he at last went farther so that the sword came now on the right side now between his legs and universal laughter arose in which the man in a hurry who was likewise a merry fellow chimed in and let baruch have his own way till the happy hour was past when for the first time there followed general pleasure and agreeable conversation till deep into the night unfortunately Barish and we through him had a certain other propensity for some girls who were better than their reputation by which our own reputation could not be improved we had often been seen in their garden and we directed our walks thither even when the young count was with us all this may have been treasured up and at last communicated to his father enough he sought in a gentlemanly manner to get rid of the tutor to whom the event proved fortunate his good exterior his knowledge and talents his integrity which no one could call in question had won him the affection and esteem of distinguished persons on whose recommendation he was appointed tutor to the hereditary prince of dessa and at the court of a prince excellent in every respect found a solid happiness the loss of a friend like Barish was of the greatest consequence to me. He had spoiled while he cultivated me, and his presence was necessary, if the pains he had thought good to spend upon me were in any degree to bring forth fruit for society. He knew how to engage me in all kinds of pretty and agreeable things, in whatever was just appropriate, and to bring out my social talents but as i had gained no self-dependence in such things so when i was alone again i immediately relapsed into my confused and crabbed disposition which always increased the more discontented i was with those around me since i fancied that they were not contented with me with the most arbitrary caprice i took offence at what i might have considered an advantage thus alienated many with whom i had hitherto been on a tolerable footing and on account of the many disagreeable consequences which i had drawn on myself and others whether by doing or leaving undone by doing too much or too little was obliged to hear the remark from my well-wishers that i lacked experience the same thing was told me by every person of sound sense who saw my productions especially when these referred to the external world i observed this as well as i could but found in it little that was edifying and was still forced to add enough of my own to make it only tolerable i had often pressed my friend Barish too that he would make plain to me what was meant by experience but because he was full of nonsense he put me off with fair words from one day to another and at last after great preparations disclosed to me that true experience was properly when one experiences how an experienced man must experience in experiencing his experience now when we scolded him outrageously and called him to account for this he assured us that a great mystery lay hidden behind these words which we could not comprehend until we had experienced and so on without end for it cost him nothing to talk on in that way by the quarter of an hour since the experience would always become more experienced and at last come to true experience when we were about to despair at such fooleries he protested that he had learned this way of making himself intelligible and impressive from the latest and greatest authors who had made us observe how one can rest a restful rest and how silence in being silent can constantly become more silent by chance an officer who came among us on furlough was praised in good company as a remarkable sound-minded and experienced man who had fought through the seven years war and had gained universal confidence it was not difficult for me to approach him and we often went walking with each other 
the idea of experience had almost become fixed in my brain and the craving to make it clear to me passionate being of a frank disposition i disclosed to him the uneasiness in which i found myself he smiled and was kind enough to tell me as an answer to my question something of his own life and generally of the world immediately about us from which indeed little better was to be gathered than that experience convinces us that our best thoughts wishes and designs are unattainable and that he who fosters such vagaries and advances them with eagerness is especially held to be an inexperienced man yet as he was a gallant good fellow he assured me that he had himself not quite given up these vagaries and felt himself tolerably well off with the little faith love and hope which remained he then felt obliged to tell me a great deal about war about the sort of life in the field about skirmishes and battles especially so far as he had taken part in them when these vast events by being considered in relation to a single individual gained a very marvellous aspect i then led him on to an open narration of the state situation of the court which seemed to me quite like a tale i heard of the bodily strength of augustus the second of his many children and his vast expenses then of his successor's love of art and of making collections of count bruhl and his boundless love of magnificence which in detail appeared almost absurd of his numerous banquets and gorgeous amusements which were cut off by frederick's invasion of saxony the royal castles now lay in ruins Bruhl's splendors were annihilated and of the whole a glorious land much injured alone remained when he saw me astonished at that mad enjoyment of fortune and then grieved by the calamity that followed and informed me that one expects from an experienced man exactly this that he shall be astonished at neither the one nor the other nor take too lively an interest in them i felt a great desire still to remain a while in the same experience as hitherto in which desire he strengthened me and very urgently entreated me for the present at least always to cling to agreeable experiences and to try to avoid those that were disagreeable as much as possible if they should intrude themselves upon me but once when the discussion was again about experience in general and i related to him those ludicrous phrases of my friend Bariche. he shook his head smiling and said quote, there one sees how it is with words which are only once uttered these sound so comical nay so silly that it would seem almost impossible to put a rational meaning into them and yet perhaps the attempt might be made End quote. and when i pressed him he replied in his intelligent cheerful manner quote, if you will allow me while commenting on and completing your friend's observations to go on after his fashion i shall i think he meant to say that experience is nothing else than that one experiences what one does not wish to experience which is what it amounts to for the most part at least in this world End of section 24